All right. Okay. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm super excited to uh, be hosting Kelsey here for this fireside chat. And um, I decided to take it to the next level here and actually get a real fire going. Um, you, definitely, you definitely exceeded expectations. Uh, you know, I'm in my undisclosed location, underground bunker. <laughs> well, I have it all. There, you have a fire. Yeah, well, you know, at this time when we're all at home, I figured, wow, I could actually use my uh, my real fire that I have here as part of this. But it's okay, I'm still barefoot, so I'm still, you know, rocking the... Uh, I have pants on, so I think we have the dress code requirements. I had to have pants on for this shot, you know, otherwise. <laughs> so, Kelsey, um, thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's always been a pleasure to chat with you and... and work with on, on things with you over the years um i thought maybe we just start with uh getting your take on you know these these times i know for you you do a lot of working from home you've got the amazing mic set up there um so for for you maybe some things aren't different but for a lot of us i mean this whole virtual conference is totally new and I, i'd love to just get your perspective on it to start yeah i think like many people we really appreciate the in-person face-to-face right the body language spontaneous of it all, the conversations, the hallway tracks. And that's something that I think we miss for sure. So I think it's been interesting seeing people figure out how to recreate that, right? Like online, you know, intimate settings. I've done a couple of customer engagements via video recently, uh, some one-on-one, some community stuff. And I think as long as you kind of keep it free flowing, you know, supernatural, leave room for Q&A, and I think video helps. So yeah, for me, it's a bit natural, but seeing like the rest of the world try to do it at the same time, uh, that's, that's super interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, definitely an interesting time. Um, I think un- unprecedented for, you know, a lot of us in our, in our lifetimes. Um, but it, you know, it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this s- sets us up for, you know, success in ways that maybe we hadn't seen. Trying to be the optimist here, you know, sets us up for being able to solve some problems in the future that we'd, we'd, uh, you know, maybe not have prepared ourselves for if, if, if we didn't have these challenges. I would like to think challenges as opportunities and maybe we'll have some, some real opportunities. Yeah, I think people will start to examine, like we spend so much time in the industry talking about our technical DR plans, our technical, you know, how do we do HA in that world? But we didn't really think about it and no one's really been practicing. What do you do when business continuity is disrupted? You can't go into your office. You can't meet with your clients face to face as that was your normal road of operation. So I think it's going to be really interesting how people come out of this. Do we loosen up work from home policies? Do we practice that a little bit more? Do we make that a real first class citizen versus an anomaly like most companies practice today? So I'm really interested to see, do we just forget about this as a one time event in 100 years? Or do we go back and say, hmm, maybe we should learn how to actually leverage technology and work anywhere? Right on, right on. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's a perfect segue into when you and I were chatting about some of the topics that we'd love to talk about. You know, I think one of the first one was just sort of um, talking about the history of cloud native and sort of where we came from um, and uh, how it's, uh, you know, we can learn a lot from our past and we can use that to, uh, to, to build better things in the future. And so I thought, you know, I'd, I'd start by just saying, you know, I'd love, I'd love to hear from you as you've thought about, you know, the past what we've done, um, some of the big achievements there and, and the successes and how that's really helped shape us um, and how you hope some of that stuff's going to help us with the current challenges that we have in the cloud native, native ecosystem and, and where people are, are butting their heads and, and, and things that we can use from the past that, to help us solve some of those problems in the future. Yeah, so my journey, you know, like a lot of people, you know, I had a big ops background and, you know, got into software development a little bit later in my career. But the biggest thing I think I've seen now is when I was introduced to a lot of the theories, like one of your papers included, like some of the Mesos work early days when it was just in white paper form, there was a lot of theory that a lot of people didn't understand because we never had the ability to practice, right? I came up in a world where running bash scripts in parallel was like the hottest thing you could ever do, like parallel SSH. And then the configuration management error came in where we turned those bash scripts into declarative configs. And that was a bit of promise theory becoming something that we actually practice as an industry and via tooling. But I think when it came to distributed systems, that was still a far-fetched thing that most of us never really put the theory into practice until I think things like Mesos came out, Zookeeper, 
following up with that is etcd and now kubernetes where now i think we're going from theory and i think the practice is now driving the next set of theory what actually works in these constrained environments unlike the ones that you get to have in the lab or when you're thinking about this stuff so i think there's um been this great transition where now we're doing knowledge sharing and now we're doing co-development around these ideas and i think that's probably a really nice place to be right now yeah yeah no i i, I agree it's it, it, it's interesting. There's a lot of work that comes out of labs, you know, for, for in, in my perspective, I was at Berkeley doing a bunch of stuff there. Um, and uh, it's amazing when the, the rubber meets the, meets the road, how much, how much the practice really becomes really important for how systems get. I have, I have a question involved. for you, right? So you did all this work in the, in the Mesos world. And I think a lot of those things from the white paper came to life. We saw yeah. the system spawn from that. But now there's this Kubernetes thing. And for me, it feels like a continuation of those ideas, maybe a slightly different implementation. I think the APIs and the approach is different. Is there a big change in your world? Like, hey, this is drastically different than what you were imagining before? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I mean the, the reality is, is even when we first started to look at Mesos, there was work before us. I mean, that's just what computer science is right it's a field that's constantly evolving and we were building upon other people's work you know in our case we were building upon resource management um, cluster management uh, lots of great projects out there from the past condor is one of the ones that i often used to talk about with people um, and so we were really building on those ideas and i think it's only natural that there's evolution beyond that that there'll be more projects that come and 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 build on on top of other projects um, and, you know, I, I, I think for me, uh, you know, one of the most, I think, novel aspects of the Mesos world that we were originally doing was this notion of schedulers. And the idea behind schedulers was that software should be able to really manage itself. It should be able to operate itself. We use the word schedulers. The Kubernetes world introduced the word, the word operator which is such a better name because <laughs> when you hear the word scheduler, you think, Oh God, I got to go get a PhD to write one of those things. When you hear the word operator, a lot of people think, well, I was already doing that as a human. So perhaps I can just automate that in code. Um, and, and to me, I think one of the best continuities uh, in, in the space is to see the, you know, the growth of operators and to see more people spending time and energy trying to, to, um, to formalize those and make those be a really, really big part of the container orchestration ecosystem. Because I think those were the ideas that we were the most excited about when we were first doing this back in the day, because those were the newest ideas, because resource management, man, that's been done for a really long time. But resource management that's done by software itself, that's kind of cool. That's really fun. So, um, so it's been really excited to see that continue to grow in the ecosystem. And, and you know, I, just as you said, I think where, where the rubber meets the road the practice of how to actually build these things like we're still in the thick of that you know people are still figuring that out and um you know there's a bunch of great projects out there you know across the board from a bunch of different companies and people collaborating across the ecosystem too um around operators but i still think that there's going to be you know more and more that will, will come out of just putting these things in practice and figuring out what's the best way to build this stuff yeah i, I would say when kubernetes came out that's when the light bulb went off for me so when i looked at mesos it was like this two-part scheduler bit and it's like the line was kind of probably drawn a little bit too low for what people would do in practice. The idea that you would have to kind of figure out what is a workload and, you know, what to do after the decision is placed or what to do with the resource offer. Like, when do you give it back? There's a lot to think about through that. Whereas in the Kubernetes world, I think it was just like the lines way up here. There's only one workload type. I will do the placement, but your job is only to decide in terms of the orchestration. Like here is my thing. Uh, stop running it, start running it, and then you can build workflows on top. And then this is how we land in this world of operators where what does it mean to get a Redis database? Not necessarily what does it mean to run one or schedule one? Totally, totally, totally. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. We, um, that the, the, the level of interface, I think, is is dramatically important for when it comes to how, the, how people adopt it and how people consume it. And, uh, I think from that, that's a perfect segue into another topic we really wanted to talk about, which was, uh, you know, is the level of interface of Kubernetes the right one, um, or do we need to go even higher? I mean, there's all this talk about serverless and functions and, and you know, these higher level abstractions. Um, but 
you know, you've given some great talks and great presentations about that. And I think fired up a bunch of people to start looking at it deeper. Um, where do you think we're at with that? Is it, is it the next phase? Are we all going to jump to that? Is there, is there more work to be done? I think what we have to do is look back at other areas of compute and decide if running applications should follow suit. So if we look at the internet today, it's very complicated underneath. BGP, complex routing, protocols you don't use every day in your apps underpin the internet. And for most people, the interface is go to Best Buy, buy a cable modem, screw it in the wall, pay your bill, and you're online, right? That's how you join the internet these days because we've moved the interface so high level that anyone can do it without a technician coming to their house anymore or participating in the underlying protocols that really drive the thing. So that happened for the internet and now billions of people can use it. Billions of devices can be on it. And then we did the same thing for things like email, same thing for images, CDNs. So now we start to look at this other set of areas of compute around data management, whether you consider that a database or something like an object store like Google Cloud Storage S3. But compute has been this layer where we just feel that it should just remain open-ended, right? Here's a Linux server. You have access to all the sys calls. You have the init system. And people just keep building their own little towers of Babel, right? Just here's my stack and it falls down. Here's my stack and then it falls down. So I think what we've learned over the time is that there are little checkpoints that I've been seeing every decade, right? We used to call it config management. Then we had kind of the Mesos world. Now we have this Kubernetes checkpoint that sucks in a lot of the common things you need for a distributed system. Now the question I have is when do we get to the point where I can say, here is my workload. Not a 12-factor workload, not a machine learning workload, not a function, but here's my app that needs to run for some bounded amount of time, access to these resources, and you can run it for me. I think that's the end game, that's the North Star, and everything is just a checkpoint along the way, and for some people, for some workload types, this is already true, right? Like in the world of Lambda or Cloud Run or Cloud Functions, you give it a thing, a hair into its interface, but the problem with those current systems, they don't run all your apps. And that's where we land back in this middle compromise of, I can run it myself to support all of my workloads. Do you, uh, do, do, do you ever see a world where, um, you know, the Lambda-like interfaces, that level of abstraction will let us run all our apps? Do you ever see us running the databases that way, running the key value stores that way? I think there will probably be several platforms because if you think about like with the database store procedures is a hyper optimized form of compute where the compute happens very close to the data model. And in those cases, it totally makes sense. You're going to get to certain dimensions of scale where the compute's going to have to be a part of the particular thing. And that's okay, right? Those are going to be hyper optimized platforms. Lambda is one of them. But I do think at some point it's going to be less about abstractions and more about automation in my opinion. For example, if I give you a container and a little bit of config and on the back end you run it on a VM or a micro VM like Firecracker, I actually don't care about that particular abstraction. It's more of here is my app that happens to be packaged in a container. I'm still going to make Linux system calls. I'm hoping that I can grab an IP from the VPC. I'm hoping that I can apply firewall rules to that unit of compute. So I think it's more about let's change the underlying unit, right? So I want to keep the kernel. I don't think we need a new, you know, paradigm down there, but I do think we need a new unit of compute that is not quite a VM, but it has that same serverless operational model, but no limitations on what I can actually compute. And that's going to be a real hard thing to figure out because as a provider, we have to almost allow you to do anything but protect you from doing anything you want from a security and, and performance band performance place. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it sounds like a great world to me. You know, I, I <laughs> talking about Mesos being even a lower level abstraction for people trying to run these distributed systems. It's a super valuable checkpoint for a bunch of different systems to help them do things better. But the reality is, is it's even with Kubernetes now, it's still pretty low level. I love the idea of that, uh, higher level abstraction, just like, hey, here's my application. These are the resources I need. Go make it happen. Um, I, I, I'm curious, um, you know, I, I'm curious from, from, from your perspective, if you think that this is, you know, this is a, a one year, a five year, a 10 year. And if it's 10 year, are we going to get too distracted with something else shiny that we're ever going to get there? And the reason I ask this question is, I'm sure there's a lot of people out there 
in the audience in the world that are, are watching this and saying, yeah, we already had that. It was called Heroku or it was called Paz, you know, it was called Cloud Foundry, <laughs> you know, were, were those technologies just like ahead of their time? Um, or did we need some of these other checkpoints until we could actually realize, oh yeah, we got the right lower levels. We can leak, you know, we can go through those leaky abstractions if we need to, to get to stuff. But now that we've got those, we can do the higher level stuff. I'm curious your take. Yeah, so I would say App Engine, Heroku, Cloud Foundry, they all had limitations. Like you could only run a subset of computation. It just disqualifies it from where we want to be. Right. So for a subset, if all you're doing is writing maybe web apps and some web apps can be complex, but that's not enough to just run any unit of compute. So we know it's possible, right? We know that you can run any unit of compute, but I think what has to happen is, so let's, I don't know if we can predict the future, but we can actually talk about what's slowing it down. What's slowing it down is culture. People are used to having the whole box and being able to access anything unbounded. So any constraints you introduce, you're going to naturally get people pushing back and say, nope, you have to run this COBOL that I wrote in 1975. If it doesn't support that, then it's dead to me, right? So these, those are all acting as resistors to what we all want to do going forward. So either A, we're going to need a marriage between the software. That's where like Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes and Mesos plays. But we're going to have to marry that to the underlying infrastructure, kind of like the internet does. The internet doesn't work without all the hardware. And a lot of times I think we've been trying to solve this problem decoupled from the hardware to make it portable. But the truth is we're going to have to start making some choices where we compress some of that complexity. Like in the cloud, you see a lot of things are offloaded to hardware to make those hypervisors work at scale. Same thing for encryption, right? We offload into the big load balancers to make that work at scale. So at some point on the compute side, we're going to have to make some optimizations that may say that this thing may not work outside of that world and people are going to have to get comfortable with this idea that yeah these things are going to be so complex and so optimized that you may not be able to run it on a raspberry pi it's just different worlds but the same interface could live but that whole idea of run my compute whatever i have and just run it for me that's what it's going to take right on yeah you mentioned, the, you mentioned a word there that I think is going to be perfect for transition to our next topic, uh, and that word was culture. Mm. Um, you know, and and I, I think you and I both know from both working with a bunch of organizations, working in open source communities, um, culture is kind of one of the, the biggest aspects to how we as an industry really, really evolve and, and transition, um, you know the culture of getting organizations to adopt open source or the culture of getting organizations to be agile and write microservices and kind of change the, the, the structure of, of how, how they're organized. Uh, and again, not always, if you're a really small company, maybe you don't need to change your culture. That's or, a no valid option folks. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so, you know, I, I know you and I've chatted a bunch about this, this um, in the past as well. You know, I'm, I'm curious your perspective, you know, open source is now really, the norm um, for for how most of us engage, and in fact, that's how I have a lot of my friends that I just still hang out with just through open source communities. That's how I met them. That's how I how I've continued to to stay in touch with them. Um, and open source has become such an important and prevalent part of of what we do. Um, but I think you know there's there's pros and cons, and there's you know there's there's benefits and there's there's detractors. Um, and I thought we'd spend a little bit of time just kind of talking about. Uh, how, how you're seeing the open source communities and open source in general um, in, uh, in our industry. Yeah, so I think it's, humans just work this way in general. If, 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 a, if you want to see something major happen, then you're going to have to have a bigger group of people collaborate. And that means you're going to have to have a way to communicate with that broad group. So if you only want 10 people to accomplish something, well, maybe you can confine your communication to 10 people. But some of these ideas we have are at a global scale. And that means you're going to have to be supporting multiple languages. You're not going to be able to pick and choose who comes and goes. There's no way for you to estimate all the talent that's available globally. So the only way to participate or get that done is to be as open and transparent as, as possible and encourage people to contribute. So I think when we say open source, we're really referring to the drawbacks of closed source, right? The idea that there's only a small set of people who understand the code base there's a small set of people who can improve the code base. And there's a ton of drawbacks, even outside of the philosophy about should software be open or free. 
having it closed just limits how fast it can improve. It's just that straightforward. So I think what we're seeing now is the benefits of open source. Here's what happens when thousands of people contribute we're proving the point that there's no way that a proprietary vendor who has closed limited resources and ideas can never compete with something that is open to the world and the world contributing. That's, I think that's a foregone conclusion at this point. So now going forward, I think all the people who don't understand that piece are feeling the pain, right? They're not moving as fast as they can or want to because they've limited themselves. They, they're putting artificial limitations in play that don't need to be there. So open source instead of an enterprise, I've gone to a lot of companies, and you've probably done it too, where there's only a few teams that can see this part of the code base and a few teams that can see that part of the code base. And when those teams leave, there are people that don't even know anything about that code base and they're just scared to touch it. No one can deploy it again and it just staggers and no one gets to, it just doesn't evolve anymore. Yeah, yeah. Right. No, I'm 100% agree. I, I, I think the writing's on the wall and, and everyone understands the value of, of, of open source. What about the negative sides, though? You know, like to, to be able to play a little bit of the, 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 the devil's advocate here, you know, I, while we all see that, and I think that's why we're all pulled in, in that direction, um, you hear and you see some of the negative stuff come up as well. And, you know, I, I think it would be fair to, to, to see, see, see both sides of the coin. You know, things I'll throw out there, like people being concerned about, the big clouds being able to consume all the open source better than some of the smaller organizations. Things like people not actually contributing back, companies being able to take advantage of open source, but there's no mechanisms to contribute back. You know, do you think that we'll figure some of this stuff out or do you think that like this isn't a problem? These aren't real detractors? It depends on what your intent is. You know, if we look to, you know, people who've created tools like Linus Tolbert and Git, for example, he didn't want to build a business around Git. He, he kind of let it be free and it got mass adoption and companies like GitHub that are venture backed, now owned by Microsoft, were able to take it and evolve an ecosystem around it. Now we have GitHub. So his intent was not necessarily worried about someone taking it and running with it. He would always have the tool to use at the level he designed it for. And if people want to step up and start a business or make it better, they can do that. So I think at that level, it's fine. I think where it gets a little bit blurry is when you do want to build a sustainable business around this model, right? So on one hand, you want to make sure that the code base is open to all of your users and customers, the people who pay you money, so they can evolve it and you make a promise to them that you'll review that code and make sure that it's maintained even when they stop contributing it. So that whole maintainership plus building the business kind of puts a lot of pressure on the maintainer side I've been a solo maintainer of projects before and I can remember getting emails from like larger corporations like, Hey, we love your tool, but we want free support, right? We want, you know, you to fix all of the bugs that we have. Here's our list. And I'm looking back at them like, um, you get what you pay for. <laughs> I'm happily will issue you a refund because I can't necessarily give you the same level of service that an Amazon or Google can give you when those projects are backed by lots of dollars. The other part is if you're trying to build a business, wow, man, you, you're, you're kind of giving, it's hard to make money on things that no one has to pay for. So you have to figure out where that line is. Where do you want to draw the line and say, for this, you have to pay. For some companies, it's around services, knowledge, education, or maybe you do it around a certain set of features. But once you draw that line around a certain set of features, you now have to ask them the question, well, how open is this source code? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, I, you know, from, from companies that you've, you've been working with, um, you know, are you seeing more companies draw lines and say, all right, we're going to, we're going to open source this chunk. We're going to create a community out of this chunk. We saw the writing on the wall. We want to get a bunch of people contributing, but we've got this other thing over here that we need to keep as our own proprietary because that's how the business is going to grow. I'll mention the companies that do it well. I think HashiCorp has found a good way of balancing this out, right? Their core feature set seems to be pretty great. You can get a long way with it. It's pretty easy to identify the areas where you have to extend it. Terraform, for example, if you want to manage state in a central way, you can throw it on an S3 bucket or something like that. But then on the enterprise side, they may hold back features like their policy management, right, with Citadel, or they may have their own kind of sassy components but they seem to have drawn the line. And when they've drawn the line wrong, like 
in my opinion, they've drawn the line wrong in like Vault in some places, like some of the HA stuff in Vault. But then maybe a year or two later, they announced like, hey, it's time for us to move this enterprise only thing directly into the open source because we see it as a critical component to really make this thing useful. So in that case, I think we have to try to give them a little bit of room to experiment, right? And I think some people are experimenting emotionally. Sometimes it's a little bit too fast and it's confusing. So one day as a customer, you may change the license on me and say, I can't run this software from this provider or I can't allow my favorite consultant to sell me a product based on this open source product because I really like their service. And scale that all the way up to the cloud provider as a consumer, you start to look at those companies and say, well, this is no different than a proprietary vendor giving me restrictions on how and where I can run this software and who gets to run it. Because what if I'm on the other side of this coin at some point? So I think that's just one where I look at it as an experimentation. If you notice that you cut too low or too high, you have to listen to the community you're attempting to serve and walk it back. Right on. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Kelsey, for that. Well, it looks like my fire is starting to, uh, to dwindle here. I think that that might mean it's, uh, it's time to start wrapping up. Um, I, th I thought I'd just throw it back to you. You know, anything that you're seeing out there that you're super excited about or, uh, you know, anything you, uh, you just you want to give a shout out for, um, love, to, love to give you a chance to do that. I think all these people that are building the second wave of systems, right? Now that Kubernetes has been in production, the buzz is starting to wear off a little bit. Pragmatism has now entered uh, the top line thing. So the stuff that people are doing around security, open policy agent, the things that people are building around those things, uh, the stuff that you know people like WeaveWorks are doing with the whole GitOps, formalizing the practice that I think a lot of people have been practicing but they're really help pushing this idea that infrastructure is data or infrastructure is code and building pipelines around that stuff. So the thing I like the most is that the amount of sharing that we're seeing from people that are doing this in production and then either sharing the tools that they've built or the ideas that they've built really balances out a lot of the hype that we see around products. And also kind of a show you all, I remember um, before going to Google, I spent some time in the Mesosphere office on a whiteboard with uh, you know, some of the founders and Flo and all these folks. And it was really about Mesos, but I think they understood that there was a sea change happening. And instead of fighting it down right, it was like, look, they became some of the biggest contributors at the time to Kubernetes, bringing some of the things they learned from Mesos. And recently with the name change, right, D2IQ, kind of recognizing that, look, it's not about one specific implementation, whether it's gonna be Mesos or Kubernetes, really saying, what do people need right now? And if this is where the ecosystem is, there's a lot of knowledge, history that we can bring to that world that will still benefit people. So to me, that's a real big sense of maturity, not to go down and die on a particular hill based on logos or particular implementations, but really staying around to service people and meeting them where they're at. So I give a big shout out to all the companies that are doing that. Right on, right on. I appreciate that, Kelsey. That's awesome. Cool. Well, I think the last time I might have seen you was uh, at, at last year's KubeCon and I'm uh, we had a lot. What was that? Was that last, last time I saw you? Ice Cube? Ice Cube? So I'll never forget that. That was, that was extra dope. So I think I, you have the all time best after party at any tech conference ever. Oh, that was super fun. Yeah, we had a lot of fun. Well, hey, thanks so much for spending the time with us. Um, and I look forward to uh, doing this with you sometime again soon. Awesome. Catch you later, Ben. Cool, man. See ya.